In March of 2020, I signed my first AAA contract appointing me as an engine programmer for the Sea of Thieves team. This came exactly 370 days after I finished making my first ever game prototype. Let me tell you how I made that happen. In January of 2019, I was your average computer science student at the University of Southampton, which is located in the south of Her Majesty's Great Britain. If you've never been, then all you need to know is that the weather is awful, the food is questionable, and the sun shines about eight hours a month. Up to this point, I was focusing on cybersecurity and to be completely honest with you, I was hating every minute of it. I had originally planned to specialize in computer graphics, but to my unblock, the professor who was teaching that course decided to migrate to Hawaii. There was one final chance for a savior for my game addicted self to actually enjoy part of my undergraduate degree, a game design module in my final semester. You could say that this module made me fall in love with programming again, but that'd be understating what happened. Not only did I get to spend my time in school learning about what made games fun, but I was literally told to go home, play games, get inspired, and then build games based on those inspirations. Our first project in this module was what really began driving my love for game development. We were given a simple brief and told we had two weeks to make a game prototype based off that brief. It was simple. Make a tutorial for a game that has a single core dynamic from scratch in Unity. The goal of this project was to learn how to integrate a tutorial into a game without making the player feel like they're in a tutorial, but instead integrating it into the level design, introducing mechanics one by one until the player gains all the knowledge and skills they need to play the actual game. Me, being someone who enjoys puzzles, as well as frustrating myself over and over again, I naturally went for spatial reasoning as my core dynamic. Spatial reasoning games are those which require players to think ahead of time and determine possible results of an in-game puzzle by analyzing what the possible moves are and figuring out what needs to be done to complete these puzzles. My unique twist on the generic puzzle platformer was that the player had to control their character in two separate worlds simultaneously, with these two worlds having different structures. This gave me the ability to introduce the world's most successful game feature to my prototype, frustration. Are you good? fucking kidding me? <laughs> This also meant that it was entertaining to watch people play the game, and whilst working on the game in the labs, I had most of the people in my course come up to me asking to play the game. Seeing people's reaction to Mirage in combination with scoring a high grade, and even more importantly having enjoyed the entire development process, really made me feel like I had found a passion which I was also good at. Our next project was a little less fun, but still taught me some valuable things. For example, Brachys is a hero and should be added to the YouTube Hall of Fame. Oh yeah, and integrating interesting stories into games is hard like really hard. It really made me appreciate games like The Witcher and Portal. Our brief was to build a game with a parallel storytelling engine, with the player's gameplay choices and NPC interactions affecting the way in which the game unfolded. My game was called The Ring of Power, and was highly inspired by another famous story about a ring. It was simple. If you made evil choices along the way, such as killing an innocent bunny, then you'd have a harder time defeating the bosses at the end, and you'd likely end up losing some family members as a result. Whereas if you made good decisions, such as helping NPCs by giving them your abilities so that they can fend for themselves, you'd be rewarded with easier paths as well as reduce your risk of losing family members. It wasn't my greatest work, but it sure as heck made me appreciate those games which do include complex storylines. My final project for this university module was my favourite so far. Our brief was to build a game which included real-time procedural generation. I couldn't wait for this one as I knew exactly what I wanted to build. I would combine my favourite mobile game, Boost, with real-time audio analysis. Huge shout out to Joseph Furrier. Atomically, the game was quite simple. As the player moved through the world, music would be played, and based on the analysis of the different audio frequencies of this song, pillars would be procedurally spawned at different locations. The player's goal here was simple, survive as long as possible. To increase the complexity of the procedural generation algorithm, I added my own custom smart motion tracking system. Let's say a player was more likely to move to the right, then the pillars would have a slightly higher probability of spawning to the right of this player in the future, and this would continue updating until the player eventually died. This made for really interesting replayability in the game. With this course coming to an end, a realization hit me. I was done with game development. I was three months away from graduating and all I could think about was wanting to continue making games. But instead, I was being pushed to apply for jobs at banks and security companies. Even the thought of doing so made me feel depressed. So instead of applying for these jobs, I sat down at my computer and started searching for ways to get myself a job in the games industry. And after days of searching, I found her the Masters of Games Engineering course at the University of Newcastle. On their website, they had a list of all their graduates and where they went to work. And at this point, the gaming fanboy in me took over and I said to myself, I'm going to get my name in the credits for one of these games. So naturally, I applied, and thanks to my grades, projects, and email writing skills, I was accepted for the coming fall. This meant I had a few months to work on some side projects to prepare me for this course, as I knew it wasn't going to be a walk in the park, so being prepared was probably a good idea. 
Fortunately, I already had quite a bit of experience with C++, having worked on computer vision based security systems in the past. My first summer project was completing the Learn OpenGL tutorials, which taught me modern OpenGL, filling in the gaps I had from missing out on the graphics module during my undergrad. After I was done with OpenGL, I opened up YouTube and started following along with the Chernos Game Engine series, which helped me enhance my foundational game engine knowledge along with a few good books. I even managed to squeeze in adding basic Vulkan support to my engine. That was probably the most productive summer I'd ever had. And now that it was coming to an end, I felt like I had gained the fundamental tools to continue my game development journey in Newcastle. If you're based in the UK and you want to work in the games industry, I couldn't recommend this course more. We had some incredible teachers and lab assistants who stayed in the labs till late at night in order to help us out. On top of this, we had members of the games industry come in from all over the country to give talks about life on the job, as well as walk us through different experiences they'd had and different projects they'd worked on. The course itself was split into three semesters. The first semester involved learning C++, then learning the foundations of graphics for games, and finally learning about different technologies for games, such as physics and networking. Then the second semester involved working in a group of around 8 students to build a game engine from scratch, which ran on both Windows and the PS4, and then build a golf-inspired game to run on both of those platforms using this engine. Then in the final semester, we would either undergo a personal project with a thesis, or if we were fortunate enough to acquire a job in the games industry by the start of the semester, we could write a paper on the work that we did whilst on the job. For the most part, the first semester went really smooth for me. I had completed a project to simulate combinatorial strategies for variations of the 15 puzzle problem using multi-threaded C++. I then created my own graphic simulation using my engine to create this alien looking scene. I then created my own physics and networking engine to run a terrible remake of the Untitled Goose game. If you haven't already, definitely play that game by the way. It's great. And then in the second semester during the team project, I expanded my engine to be compatible with PS4 and worked with a couple of my teammates to build the best possible multi-platform prototype we could. I say a couple, because unfortunately some of them had to leave the country as a result of COVID beginning to take effect. Then just before the end of this semester, some of my friends and I created a tool to help create Vulkan graphics pipelines using Qt, because doing this manually was a bit at the time. By the end of the second semester, I felt like I had gained a ridiculous amount of knowledge and that I could possibly hold my own at a job in the games industry. So I had a quick skim through the Cracking the Coding interview book, went through my C++ and graphics notes, and then started applying for jobs. I interviewed for a couple of companies, including Activision, Rebellion, Creative Assembly, and even Ubisoft. The issue with those guys is that they wanted me to send in a coding exam, which they then took from a few weeks to a few months to respond to. And during this waiting time, something happened. I received a message on LinkedIn from a guy named Robert, whom I had heard of from my friend Dale, who was a PhD student at the time. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but Robert was the CEO and founder of a company called Coconut Lizard. I hadn't heard of them before, so I did a little research. Turns out, Robert used to own a company called Pitbull Studios, which he then sold to Epic Games and turned it into Epic Games UK. He had then left Epic to create this new company, and in doing so, he brought along a handful of Unreal Engine specialists, including leads and senior engine programmers who had been working on Unreal Engine since its early days. I'm not gonna lie to you guys, I was a little bit nervous. I mean, who wouldn't be? During my interview day, I got to talk to the entire team about what they were working on at that time, and then got invited to lunch with all the leads and seniors. During lunch, we spoke about my projects, the games industry and made some jokes about C++. Then after lunch, we walked back to their office and at this point I thought I was about to go through a coding interview, or maybe they'd send me home with one. I wasn't too sure. But to my surprise, they offered me the job then and there. They even invited me to come and sit through one of their internal meetings. Needless to say, I was over the moon. I accepted their offer and the next month I began working on their active project, which just happened to be Sea of Thieves. And that's the story of how I went from working on my first game project to working on Sea of Thieves in one year. During this time, my daily agenda was simple. Learn something new every day. I hope my story motivates you to work hard on your projects and achieve your goals. If you have any questions for me, feel free to pop them in the comments below. And if this video gets a thousand likes, I'll make another video talking about my experience on the job. And just before I leave you to build your own games, if you're working in Unreal, check out some of my other videos distilling Unreal Engine systems. Maybe they'll be of use to you. Tell somebody you love them, and I'll see you in the next one.